Uh, welcome to a special bonus edition of the Metal Hammer podcast. I'm Mo and I'm joined by the one, the only, Trivium frontman, Twitch superstar, I think it's fair to say these days, Mr. Matthew Heafy. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, man. I see we both have our apocalypse beards growing nicely. <laughs> <laughs> this is just my beard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel like every dude has like a beard right now. Every single one that doesn't normally have a beard. But yes, you do normally have something. Yes, but I never have this, this mess. And you can see my Irish side now. See the redness? Oh, wow. Oh yeah, look at that. There's, there's what that is it, third what is the other half think of the beard because uh, my, mine um, is not. I've been saying I might try out some comedy mustaches and my mine. Is <laughs> <laughs> she she knows that it's you know it's pandemic beard. So I was just running because there was a bee on my head as I was pointing out my beard. Oh okay, good. That, that's what that was. Yeah, good old Florida. Every everything in the state will will try to kill a human as we will be discussing about the Tiger King. Good, good. Yeah, well, yeah, that was. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be yep. my first my first uh, point of discussion. Um, I mean, if there was ever proof that you are a man that knows how to read the room, it's surely your cover of I Saw a Tiger by Joe Exotic. Yep. It's, just... it's at least these days that I've learned how to read a room. I, I think it's within the last two records I've learned how to read a room. So. Uh, okay, interesting. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, it feels like people are, obviously, we're doing this. We were supposed to do this in person in London. Obviously, that's not happened because of everything that's going on. And it feels like people are more desperate than ever for kind of, fun shit that makes them feel yes good. yes I think yes definitely uh proven that with the reactions to a lot of the stuff you're doing at the moment well that's why i'm i mean i've been streaming this intensively for two and a half years five days a week off tour seven days a week on tour but i i look at it it reaffirms even more now for me people need something to watch and do and help hopefully help them disconnect i like that it's a place now it's a way to keep people off the streets essentially that i'm keeping entertainment going for them i'm able to to present a good message, in my opinion, of especially what's happening right now, because like this isn't the end of the world, nor is this something this this bee really wants me, nor <laughs> is this something that should be brushed off and taken lightly. This is something that needs to be approached somewhere in the middle of let's be precautious, let's let's be preemptive, let's get this thing done with by encouraging. I've been preferring the term social, uh, sorry, over social distancing. I've been preferring the term physical distancing. Yes, very the true. Reason I've heard a lot of people say this. Yes, because social distancing is encouraging people to be really inward and it's sort of isolating people away. So I've been pushing people, no, we need social connectivity from a safe distance, whether that's six plus feet away, you know, waving to your neighbor and talking to them from six feet away or having, you know, being somewhere where you're talking to a human six feet away, you're not going to get sick. Mm -hmm. Um because yeah i don't want people to feel isolated and socially isolated and while people are struggling to make ends meet people losing their jobs people don't have things to do i'm so happy that i'm able to provide a place that it is their pub their coffee shop their local restaurant their library their music venue it's all these things in one and that's why that's what always, that's what always has motivated me to make music first of all but to do this as well i feel like this is an extension of it it's it's making people's day just a little bit better during this time so i think that that's why the whole world gravitated towards Tiger King because it's ridiculous. It puts our lives into perspective and shows that now I know a lot of other parts of the world are going to see this and go, Holy cow, this is like, this is an isolated incident. This does not happen much. That show is very Florida, very Oklahoma, <laughs> very Texas, and at times very America. Like yeah. a lot of those things aren't that shocking when we're watching them, but then some things are incredibly shocking. So I think for us, I think there's like a psychology of people who watch horror films that have high anxiety or depression. It actually helps them. I'm, I'm, I, maybe it's counteracting those intense things or, or seeing something that is going through that kind of trauma and not you. So whatever Tiger King is for the world right now, it's making people feel a little bit better. Normally, my wife and I, we don't ever watch dramatic things or intense things, but we've been watching Chernobyl and Tiger King. Oh, wow. I don't know. I don't know why, but yeah, Chernobyl's I, I guess, pretty intense to be watching in these times, God. Yeah, and man, episode one or episode all of them, it makes me feel like likely how the response was done in a couple of countries to this, even. Um, yeah, that's, I, I, I think that this kind of makes it a tale as old as time. So I think it is like watching things that are slightly more disastrous helps put things into perspective a little bit more for us and makes us realize that it's not that bad i mean this isn't a nuclear reactor outside of our house although this is something very deadly but yeah tiger king tiger king uh the show's it's, nuts it's, I, I i knew it was time to cover that song right away i loved yeah. that song people want me to do hey kitty kitty or here kitty kitty but that song does incite and encourage violence against another person and that's something i don't want to don't want to promote like the video is hilarious the song's hilarious but 
we all don't really know what happened in that in that situation and yeah and i'm not sure i want to <laughs> yeah <laughs> quite frankly yeah holy things, cow man yeah I, I mean yeah god knows what's going on it definitely feel like it was something that kind of was unleashed onto the world at exactly the right time you know everyone was just desperate to find something crazy yep. and i don't know if fun's even the right word because there's a lot of strange and dark and difficult. yeah because episode one is fun you're like oh man this is this is gonna be really good and then instantly you're like this is insane yeah. it's it's like all those uh cheesy made for tv i don't know murder mystery shows but real yeah really yeah almost too strange for fiction yeah exactly and what i love so much too if the difference of me doing live streaming versus pre-produced videos is live is it's always connected like i'm always there so whatever is new i could try it immediately like when that witcher song came about i kept getting i had thousands right. of tweets people again asked me, super zeitgeist d right on the yeah. money people are talking about <laughs> yeah thousands of people were texting me like or messaging me on social media like hey is that you on witcher i was like what so i finally looked it up it's like i guess that kind of sounds like me but not really maybe the way i would pronounce things i believe the, the singer's polish you know he was singing sounds kind of british i'm distantly british like probably like 33 percent irish and like there's a little bit of british in there as well okay but i pronounce things british i noticed in my singing which is interesting as a lot of british diction singers is pronounce. very eloquent and i noticed that british singers will pronounce things kind of americanized sometimes um so maybe that's what it is that the polish singer britishizes his stuff and then me the half japanese irish american guy britishizes his singing and that's where people saw the connection so that's why i covered that song as well it's just i'm able to do them in the moment this morning oh, what did i do i did uh everybody by backstreet boys and made it super dark so and, <laughs> and then i did it was it was a tv show from iceland called lazy boy or lazy town and they have lazy town. the kids TV lazy show. town yes with the girl yes. with the pink hair uh i only saw the guys look like a mutant phil dunphy from modern family the guy with yeah. the weird yeah hair. yeah it's like a girl and some puppets and like yes a bad guy and a yeah yeah so it was, it was the about. it was the song like the super villains like anthem but okay. it sounds like an like an umpa kind of german or gypsy jazz or eastern european or nordic like da, 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 but dark it sounds kind of like danny elfman uh it sounds like that vibe that i think my chemical romance had on mama or er, okay. yes mama and avenged had on the song with oingo boingo oh um a uh, little piece of heaven yes so it's yeah. that kind of vibe but it was a kids show so i did that this morning as well and i made that one also really strange i did mouth trumpet and stuff so that's the that's the beauty of live like i don't have to produce it or correct it and having like a setup that's already pretty good i can just make things on the fly and that's what tiger king was yesterday i was like i, I love this song i'm gonna make it and i had a text from my a r guy at the label while i was streaming he's like uh so sirius satellite radio wants to play your cover can you send it to us so now they're going to be playing that on satellite radio too, which is ridiculous. Do you have to get that cleared? Does someone have to reach out to Joe Exotic's people? <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty darn sure that Joe didn't sing or write that. Um, well, I, so I have heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't wait for the conspiracy theories behind that show. That's, that's going to be fun. That's oh man, we fun. could be here all day. Um, I yeah. mean, in between all this, in this wonderful uh, kind of happy content making that you're doing for everybody, um, you and Trivium have managed to put an album together. Uh, what the Dead Men Say, out April 24th. Um, it is a hell of a record. We're going to get into that in some depth on, on the podcast at a future date. Um, there's an interview with you in the brand new issue of Milham that's just come out, actually, where you're kind of talking about the recording process for this. And it's interesting because it felt like there was quite an extended cycle after um, the Sin in the Sentence. You know, it's been two and a half years, which I suppose isn't too long, but maybe was a bit longer Long than for anticipated mm -hmm. um and uh it, i thought it was quite telling that once you finally got the space and the time to make an album you just got in the studio and you just didn't mess about it was one of the kind of quickest turnarounds you've had on an album right yeah it took us 16 days to record the entire record That's but it's crazy. because we've been we started writing some of these riffs when sin came out and we never told anybody that's what's pretty amazing too that i am essentially the Truman Show, I'm always online somehow and always making content, but no one was the wiser that I was going to the studio at night when I was warming up and doing like morning streams. No one knew we were writing material. That's what's beautiful. Like even though in this super connected age, we can try to strike up some mystery because one of the things, the concepts we got right 
early on with Trivium is that we like to rebel against things that we do or that other people do. Like we like to look at what is every band doing? How can we do it the exact opposite? And we did the same thing on Vengeance Falls, I remember, where every day we'll post a picture of something in the studio, like a picture of the mixing board. You guys aren't going to believe what's coming next. And like that's what we've sort of seen all bands have turned to. And the initial spike in interest and excitement is here. Then it quickly starts to go down because there isn't something there. So we loved that with Sin, we had everything ready, didn't tell anybody what was up, and the first thing that we drop is a new video and a new song. So we're like, let's, let's make that kind of idea as well again, but do it a bit different. So we mm -hmm. knew we wanted to make the record. We got the deadline in. We had the record totally finished for quite a bit before ever deciding what we're going to do. But we set up, all right, here's the release date months back. Here's when this video comes out, this video comes out. Now let's tease it up a little bit, but not over tease because we'll lose people's attention. Let's try to do it different. That's why we started doing the photos and just trying to come up with new exciting ways to tease and to build anticipation with all the tools that we have today versus just, just allowing it to all be out. We, mm -hmm. we very carefully curate the content that we're going to do. That's cool. And, and, and in terms of the kind of um, the output that that has resulted in, um, it feels like very much a, a continuation of um, the sin in the sentence, but it feels like a very layered record. Um, I mean, how did you kind of manage to filter all these different ideas and, 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 and bring this big melting pot together into something that still manages to have all these different things going on on it, but still feels like a very concise album. I mean, it's, it's kind of only nine full proper mm -hmm. tracks on there. Mm -hmm. um, so We looked back at everything we've ever done everything we've ever done, everything from right and wrong and good and bad. For Ember, Ascendancy in Waves, Shogun, Sin, and Dead Men, we didn't think, are people going to like this? Are people not going to like this? When we did Ascendancy, we had no fans. We just made the kind of music that made us excited. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things. We, we made what we wanted to hear, not thinking if people are going to like or love or, or hate or loathe. Mm -hmm. um, we made sure that what we did was the same process that we did when we made those records. When we made those records, we started the riffs. We'd all get in a room with the four of us, no one else. We wouldn't allow the producer in by that point. We wouldn't let anyone else hear the music. We'd get the songs to a point where they're about 100%, in our eyes, 100%, mm -hmm. where we can play and sing the stuff. Because a big thing that we didn't do on Crusade, Vengeance, and, si and Silence, and it's something that most bands surprisingly don't do, is vocal pre-production. I know that should be like a given. Like, if you're going to write a record, you should make sure you can play it and sing it. But a lot of bands don't do that, including us for three out of nine of the records. Crusade was my decision because we're in a weird place with our band at that point. I mean, we've gone over that, that stuff quite a bit, but I just didn't want to do vocal pre-production. We weren't really speaking as a band. We had all the reactions of, you know, all of a sudden we've got a territory that loves our band, that embraces our band, that chain reaction caused all of our, you know, peer bands and some of our favorite bands to really despise us and not want to bring us out and bully us and talk badly about our band. So it created that, also having like metal fans not understanding that we were a metal band was very difficult for us when we released Ascendancy. So I think the crusade is why we rebelled so hard against everything we did in Ascendancy. Um, and the crusade being in that weird place with the band as well, we just didn't want to do much extensive pre-production. We just wrote the music, said, let's make something that's completely opposite. For Vengeance and Silence, it was our producers that said, all right, let's not make the stuff too there let's have it 60 to 75 percent there i want you to be malleable don't want you to be overly sold an idea because a lot of bands when they finish their stuff 99 to 100 percent there they don't want to make any changes in the studio they're like the song is done we're not going to expand upon it um so that made sense why this producer wanted to do that but those three records as well sorry i'm kind of going on tangent i'm trying to hit all the ingredients of what yeah, that's all good there's, i mean there's a lot of there's a there's a real it feels like with trivium there's been a real journey to get to this point you're at right now uh, yeah, all bands go on a journey, but you can really sense the kind of the steps you've taken and the kind of the the end result that that has led to, which is um, what the dead men say. You can you can really feel each step you've taken to kind of get here. So I can definitely see yep. a lot of different things to get through. And yeah, with those three records as well, we decided to consciously stay in a lane. We said we're going to stay here. We're not going to go over here, over here. But the other six, we allowed everything to happen. And I feel like that's why I love the other six so much. That's why I know that our fans love the other six so much. And that's why those other three, while there are some really fantastic songs on them, it didn't allow that full breadth of what Trivium is. And what Trivium sound is, is allowing everything to be there. Simplicity and complexity, technicality and um, brutality and moments of melodicism and simplicity, technicality, like all those things have to exist 
for it to truly be a tripping record. And that's how what the dead men say and what sin in the sentence are. Sin in the sentence from Ember through Sin was eight records that were opposite from each other. Like I used to think Ember and Ascendancy were, were linked, like Ember was the baby brother, but it's really not. It's actually quite different. There's a lot more, a lot more metalcore, like early 2000s influence of metalcore, early 90s era of melodic death metal, and then 80s thrash that is Ember. And then Ascendancy expand upon that with more ingredients brought in. So eight records that were different. Sin captured the best ingredients of one through seven and nine captures the best ingredients of one through eight. So it's just allowing anything to happen, not setting any boundaries, truly having the music there between the four of us before ever setting foot with the producer, and then working with the producer that's not gonna come in as a leader, working with the producer that's, that wants to work on the same page like a fifth band, or mm -hmm. band member as us. And those are the main ingredients of why and how we got to Deadman. Awesome. Well, uh, like I said, it's a hell of an album and, and, um, and we'll do the full review on a, on a future episode of the podcast for sure. Um, one of the things we thought we'd do with you this time out is we talk about some of the music you've been listening to recently because uh, a lot of people are looking for good stuff to listen to. We all got more time on our hands these days. Um, mm -hmm. Let's use it to, to get into some more metal uh, where possible. Um, so you sent me, when I asked you for, for some ideas on what you wanted to talk about, you sent me uh, I mean, an absolute banquet of metal <laughs> to, to kind of pour over. Initially, you sent a few tracks over, um, and then you sent like a really long playlist with loads of great stuff on it. So we'll kind of pick bits and bobs from there. Um, I thought what was interesting is you kind of mentioned a lot of this stuff is stuff that actually went into influencing Ascendancy. I thought, I thought that'd be appropriate because, you know, Ascendancy is the record that really introduced Trivium to the UK and gave us our first home. So I wanted to go over the ingredients that people maybe don't know so much about because when people first thought of us they're like all right these guys you know they listen to metallica and megan van Terra and testament and slayer it's like yeah that's what got us into metal but the reason why ascendancy and the reason why trivium is so unique is because we allow all these other things within so i think that a lot of these tracks would be super eye-opening to people to go wow that is an ingredient of trivium i guess that makes sense yeah well let's get stuck straight into it um death the sound of perseverance 1998 uh death's final album of course before chuck passed away um, why, why was this the album you kind of wanted to flag up in particular? Uh, what do you think about this record in terms of what presents, represents for the journey Death had had up until that point? This Amazing was my first record hearing Death, obviously at the end, which is kind of bizarre. I did go backwards. I do recognize and love how much individual thought patterns and symbolic and human are on the evolution of what we do. But sound was the first time I ever heard guitar playing married with vocals like this because at this point i had already been into black metal and death metal melodic death metal but then hearing this other this other interpretation of death metal hearing how chuck treats his guitar lines like using so much vibrato and almost sounds like eastern eastern music slash asian music especially on like voice of the soul what i really learned from chuck as well is bizarre technique like that da, 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 that kind of down 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 up down picking that i do so much in ascendancy i learned from listening to death sound of per perseverance and warp zone by martyr those two records are the hidden gigantic ingredients of ascendancy that i think people at first would never really imagine but when you listen to those two records you notice all those complexities martyr is the band i learned all those bizarre jazz chords from i was going to say they, they, they were one of the bands that i wasn't so familiar with actually to be honest i kind of went and, and got into them a bit so martyr a canadian death metal band uh very mainly active from the mid 90s to mid 2000s um and, that, and yeah like you said they got so much going on there they sneak in loads of thrash metal there's some progressive influences in there it's a real mishmash of styles and pace and time signatures um, how did you get into those guys? Because they weren't really, we're kind of of a similar age and they weren't really on my radar when I was getting into the heavy. I, yeah, I never knew them, but we were, uh, I was good friends with Jason Sukoff who did Blue Demo, Ember to Inferno, Rotary United, Caffernome, Ascendancy. Yeah, we had just, yeah, we just uh, finished the Blue Demo. I, I think it was just, just finished Blue Demo or maybe we'd just been getting close to finishing Ember. I was asking Jason, because Jason is an unbelievable guitar player, unbelievable songwriter, singer, producer. So Jason, how, how do I get good? Was basically the question I asked. And he's like, if you want to get good, learn this. And he hands me a tab book of Martyr's Warp Zone. I was like, I've never heard of this band. I don't know who this is. So I started listening to it. And through Jason, I, I learned that they were heavily influenced by atheist, cynic, early death, jazz. Um, Daniel Mongrain, their main songwriter, is now the live guitar player. And I believe the full-time full, full band member of Voivod now. But this okay. dude can, he can play like Marty Friedman as far as the picking goes, but he can also do very bizarre jazz playing like Alan Holdsworth. So I think he's got his jazz composition theory degree. Like he's like formally studied or like classically trained in jazz. 
Um, and he mixed those things. That's why I always describe them as like a tech death jazz band. Um, I still have the tab book. There was a time where I was trying to, Jason's like, if you learn this whole book, you're going to be the best guitar player. I, I could not learn the whole book. <laughs> Daniel is just one of those guitar players, like an absolute freak at guitar. A lot of the guys we're seeing now that are incorporating these bizarre jazz or, or tapping techniques or extreme legato techniques, it all is from Daniel. Daniel was doing this stuff before everyone else, even on the record before Warp Zone. Um, the record after Warp Zone, Feeding the Abscess, is insane. It's very, very weird. I believe both guitar players are in a different tuning from each other. Okay. Super tech, super spastic. Um, but if people want to get started, start with Warp Zone, and you'll start to see those chords that became the chords that I use on, like, Ascendancy and Suffocating Sight. Just strange chords that you wouldn't normally picture to be there. But that death and martyr thing is like two really big components of the rhythm guitar playing and the songwriting of, of a sentence. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, definitely, definitely uh, a good band for more people to check out if they want to, uh, if they want to kind of expand their Canadian death metal knowledge a little bit, <laughs> which is never a bad thing. Um, yep. One of the bands I was really interested in that you, uh, that you mentioned for this, that was such a mainstay of the scene at the time, um, never seemed to quite, um, get the same amount of attention as, as a lot of their peers. So Poison the Well, yep. um, uh, kind of huge, huge force on the metalcore scene in the early 2000s. And, and it always felt to me like they were kind of a, almost like the connoisseur's choice of metalcore band at the time. You know, you had bands like Kill Switch Engage, Chimera, 36 Crazy Fish, Shadows Fall, all breaking through. And Poison the Well were kind of right there with those bands, but they never quite seemed to get that slightly over the top into the mainstream uh, consciousness. Why, why do you think that yep. is? Because they were fucking well, great. <laughs> yeah, the for, the former bands you mentioned definitely leaned a lot more metal than Poison the Well did. I feel like Poison the Well sure. was it, they were like hardcore and like this is just what I gathered from their music. They were like hardcore kids, punk kids that liked bringing in like a metalized sound. Yeah, that's I feel fair. like yeah, I feel like a band like Shadows Fall started metal. Maybe I, I could be wrong. They can correct me, but I feel like they started in the metal roots and then brought in hardcore and they brought in um sort of the swedish sound and death metal and like that that's fair but poison the well they were i think they were one of those bands that were too ahead of their time when they came out because now if you listen to metalcore bands now you're like poison the well was doing this poison Absolutely. the well was doing this on ops in december and tear from the red but what's scary is sometimes when i meet like really young kids that are in, in the metalcore they don't know this band like you have severely missed out on like the middle era of the roots of metalcore and hardcore uh poison the well was one of the first like true metalcore bands i heard um when before i made ember i was into all the thrash bands that we all know got in all the gothenburg bands that we all knew and then i started getting metalcore the metalcore bands that showed me what metalcore was was heaven shall burn whatever it may take caliban shadow hearts poison the well tear from the red and um see also like they're only chasing safety but under oath which i consider more like more metalcore perseverance by Hatebreed, uh jane doe converge i hope i put jane doe in there i'm not sure if i did but jane doe was a big influence on ember to inferno actually those like really dissonant nasty parts so it's just that like that subtle influence from those bands is what made trivium a little bit different than like a melodic death thrash band um those those big open simple breakdowns that i would use in like when all light dies and pillars of serpents um rain pull harder those are more from bands like poison the well and on broken wings and that era of late 90s early 2000s metalcore and hardcore sure that's cool um and and definitely stuff that can be seen there and i don't know maybe poison the well will be one of those bands i don't think they've been very active for the most part over the last decade or so it would be really great to see them be one of those bands that kind of come back and a bit better appreciate that'd be amazing that'd be amazing i mean that that record is one of the most important medical records to me ever tear from the red because yeah, sure. those moments of extreme brutality and then having like the kind of thing you'd never expect it's more like and i'm using this term purely as complimentary sense and it's not what they did but like that idea of like that kind of like punk emo singing, like yeah. emo, like when I use the word emo, I use it complimentary. I do not use it derogatorily. And I'm, maybe the band hates that I'm using that word, but something you'd see more from bands like that, like these really beautiful moments brought into that, like yeah, that kind of fragile higher, and yeah, yeah, more, more emotional versus being like, like power metal vocals or something really like intense, like metal uplifting. Mm. I feel like it was more of that. Yeah. Like you said, like fragile. Yeah, definitely. Um, you, you, man you mentioned Caliban briefly there, and, and I thought them and Heaven Shall Burn, while not being uh, musically exactly on the same level, Caliban more in the metalcore realm, Heaven Shall Burn more kind of in the extreme side of things. Um, but, you know, two very respected and long-running German bands that never really quite took off in the UK in the same way they did in Europe. I don't know if that was the case in, in America as well, but 
Um, two it very, is, yeah. really cool and, and highly influential bands that maybe people don't realize just how influential they both are. I mean, those two bands, those were some of the first metalcore bands I ever heard because when we got signed to Life Force, Life Force was a tiny German vegan straight edge metalcore label. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm not vegan or straight well, edge. We've been on one I, of those, Matt. Yeah, yeah. So they signed us and he, he sent me these records like you to check these bands out and whatever it may take and Shadow Hearts. I was like, I have never heard music like this in my life. And having really understood melodic death metal already, I said to Stefan and Life Force, I was like, man, Amon Amar, I was like, Heaven Show Burn reminds me of hardcore dudes playing Amon Amarth riffs. And Stefan's like, exactly. He's like, that's exactly how I describe their old stuff too. Like it's hardcore dudes that can play like metal guys, but they've got the roots and the ethos of hardcore music and the, lyr the lyricism of like hardcore and, and the ethics of hardcore, but they can play like super intense, melodic, epic metal, which I really liked a lot. And then Caliban having those beat down parts with also fast, thrashy things. I think Shadow Hearts, yeah, Shadow Hearts was like hearing that in Heaven Show Burn is when I wrote Pillars of Serpents and When All Light Dies. And those are the last two songs written for Ember to Inferno. And everything else before that, I've been listening to like Poison Well and, J and, and Converge mm -hmm. on, on top of the melodic death metal and thrash stuff. But then hearing those bigger breakdowns, that's why I started tuning down. That's why like those two songs are in drop D, because I could tell the Caliban, I think they're in probably drop C on that record and Heaven Show Burn. I don't know, I would imagine they're like B standard or something like that, but those bands showed me of re-adopting re the idea of melodic death metal in a different way with hard work. Yeah, sure. And, and that kind of brings us quite smoothly onto the plethora of melodic death metal that you mentioned in one of the other playlists you sent over. Um, I mean, these are all just, just such vital bands. I think most people kind of consider In Flames, Dark Tranquility and At The Gate as kind of like the holy trio of of melodic death metal and kind of the real forefathers of, of where that whole scene came from. Um, but also Arch Enemy and Soilwork, two other bands you mentioned that were just both vital as well. I thought it was really interesting that you picked uh, for Arch Enemy, you tricked a, a track from um, Wages of Sin. Uh, Cause to me, that's a record that doesn't really seem to get much kudos or much attention from the Angela mm -hmm. Gosso era. But to me, it's my favorite Angela Gosso album. That is, and, that is and it my was favorite the album Arch that Enemy record, I think yeah. a lot of people really got into Arch Enemy on, actually, yep. because by the time they did Anthems of Rebellion and We Will Rise, it felt like a lot of people were kind of ready for that next record. Yep. I think Wages is still, that is still my favorite Arch Enemy record. That's still, I think, one yeah. of the greatest things they've ever done. Um, everything about it's perfect. It's got that, it's got that like epic Euro metal feel. And I, that, people i think feel from power metal while not being a power metal band yeah, while being definitely. a melodic death metal band that doesn't feel like a gothenburg band at all because i mean they're not from i think charlie might be from gothenburg i'm not sure who else is from gothenburg yeah, most of the bands are. yeah they're not not from there so that's it's a band that incorporated that melodic death metal sound but also brought in so much more of the new wave of british heavy metal sound mm -hmm. and that stockholm and tampa death metal sound uh, Michael Mott obviously is one of my favorite lead guitar players because I put wah on pretty much everything I've ever done and that idea <laughs> is from him. Um, and you mentioning the, 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 the trinity of melodic death metal. It's so interesting to me because like now I meet a lot of people that are getting into in flames now, which is awesome. And I always tell them, I was like, if it weren't for Jester Race through Reroute to Remain, I would not exist. Like Trivium mm -hmm. would not be a band without those records if, it, if we're just purely talking about in flames. So I encourage everyone. Jester Race, Horacle Colony, Clay Man, Reroutes Remain, get those records immediately because those things are like some of the most formative records. I feel like bands like Killswitch wouldn't sound like Killswitch without them. Oh, no. like, I feel like the, one of the, the single of, most important metal bands to emerge yep. from the 90s. Like you're talking about Pantera Everybody. and Korn and Sepultura and all those bands that kind of made it big in that time. I know some of them obviously started before that. Um, but then In Flames are right up there as well. Just yeah. one of the most important bands ever. Yep. And then it's, it's funny because I think on that playlist, I actually put in something from Haven from Dark Tranquility. Because Dark Tranquility, for people that don't know, I, I know you, I'm sure you know, but like originally Anders was the singer, Anders from In Flames was the singer of Dark Tranquility. Yeah, yeah. And then mm -hmm. Michael was the singer of In Flames and they switched after the first two records. Um, but the old Dark Tranquility stuff is some of the best melodic death metal Gothenburg sound stuff there is. But Haven is where I felt like they brought in much simpler more open incorporating electronic stuff like reroute to remain did but it feels like melodic death metal plus depeche mode like it feels like violator Listen. plus <laughs> violator plus star tranquility and that's why i love that record so much emptier still that should have been a single that should have been 
like if if they were a crossover band now that could be a radio single today and do very very well i mean michael's singing voice is too powerful to have that screaming voice as well and that band's amazing yeah, soul work i think predator's portrait is one of the records predator's portrait um the record after it and reroute are the ones where i went well i can sing and scream and that's okay you're allowed to do both sure so those, those things soul are, work are uh a little bit underrated or a little bit taken for granted. Criminally, criminally they're underrated. They're not really treated like kind of uh, as much of a kind of, I guess they're not founding fathers in quite the same way some of the other bands on that list are. But you go back to some of those records. You mentioned Predator's Portrait. Chain Heart Machine is a classic. I mean, if you want an example of vital, modern sounding, uh, melodic death metal with that kind of like, slightly synthy catchy vibe under it i mean um natural born chaos is one of the greatest albums yeah. ever but they never quite I mean, seem to get the same kudos yep. as i don't know why and i would say their new re- their new record dark light and uh, Lighten is that might be their best record ever the new one wow. which is a rare Great thing shout. to say that someone's new one i mean bjorn is one of the best singers i've ever heard he can scream like anybody of any range and he can sing like halford and sing really low and also sound like modern metal out of the states but then also sound like a euro power metal band it's they it's are like criminally bench underrated. press most people as well yeah yeah they are one of the most criminally underrated metal bands of all time Absolutely. and people need to do their part because i feel like aman in flames arch enemy dark tranquility and soul work should all be packing five to ten thousand people a night in europe it shouldn't just be like two of those bands it should be all of them they're all just too damn good and I feel like a band like Sorok has also influenced bands like Kill Switch and Shadows Fall, probably. Definitely trivia, massively for us. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm just going to spread the word. <laughs> yeah, long way to continue. Um, one band that was in, is on the list, the, the Ascendancy list that you sent over that I just wanted to kind of finish on because I was fascinated to know where it came from was Muse. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So where, where, where what? what? <laughs> look, at, look at Declaration. Declaration okay. at the end section with those chords that build up. The da, 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 I'll be right here, falling away, okay. writing. Getting into Muse, I got into Muse on Absolution, and I was really into how they mixed classical progressions into. I mean, they they do they're doing indie, but it feels like Queen. It feels like rock plus indie. What kind of plus prog indie classical. or something? Exactly, and I was so into. Bellamy's usage of classical progressions and how he'd make chromatic progression centers because I used to never like the idea of chromatic but then realizing that he got the idea from Chopin and him integrating it in with heavily distorted guitar and queen influenced rock and making these beautiful ballads this was actually I feel like the choruses on ascendancy are more like muse than they are like in flames if you look at these big sing song okay. courses like like light to the flies or like ascendancy those are more like derived from Beatles era choruses than they are like a Zeppelin kind of chorus. And I feel like Muse stemmed from Beatles Queen and metal arguably stems from Zeppelin. So I feel like Trivium choruses have always been more of that Beatles formula of a chorus. I'm not saying we're as good as by any means, but that kind of like where the chorus lifts like a chorus should, like, the, like the, what you think of a chorus versus a metal chorus, like mm. Walk or Roots or um master pup uh maybe not master puppets master puppets is more of that like sing song chorus but like a chorus where it's just two words like walk or in waves like that's more from yeah. it's more from maybe like a rock song like some of the acdc stuff where it's just like a, a hook a couple of words versus a right. full paragraph or a sentence of sung stuff yeah, but yeah. muse absolution was actually a very very big influence on this record that's really interesting you say that because one thing I've always thought about Trivium, which does really set you apart, is that you're really not afraid to get wordy with stuff. Like that sometimes you hear, a, sometimes I hear a phrase or even just a word that I hear you sing, and I just think there's no other band that would put that word in there. Like, <laughs> Thank you. Like catastrophist. Have, Do you know what I yep, mean? Like, yep. like that. I was like, who the hell is the word catastrophist yep. in a metal? We had an a, we it. had an A and R guy that was so pissed that we used we had two A and R guys on the sentence. And one of which said two things. We should cut Dying in Your Arms off the record, which wow. he was completely wrong. Made freaking BBC Radio 1. And two, <laughs> he said the use of the word deconstructing was stupid in Drown and Torn Asunder. He's like, you shouldn't be saying deconstructing. He's like, that's a stupid word to use. I'm like, I'm <laughs> that's leaving. a stupid word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've been using weird large words. I mean, I know I've used Inception in two titles now, but Inception was on Ember. And I've always liked large 
large words. I feel like I wish I remember the J.K. Rowling quote from the final Harry Potter book of Dumbledore saying how words are our most it's, it's a it's really good. I wish maybe we could pop it up on the screen and after or something. But Dumbledore yeah, okay, has this on, great quote about how it. words are our most words are our most. This is what's good about us doing this over over the magic internet. I can find it. Dumbledore quote words. Yes, well, that's that's going to send up loads a, of shit, isn't it? If I Google that, <laughs> it'll be a lot. Oh, of here news. we go. <laughs> words are, in my not so humble opinion, our most inexhaustible source of magic, capable of both inflicting injury and remedying it. There it is. There you go. How about that? That's yep. beautiful. And maybe that's a wonderful way to uh, to finish up here with some Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's let's quickly run through all these excellent bands you mentioned because there might be people listening to this or watching this who uh, kind of want some rough place where to start. So if you could only pick one track to just throw on a playlist from all these bands, let's let's try and do that if we can. I know it's not easy. Um, let's start. Well, let's start at the top. Let's start with Death. Let me, can I, can I consult my list while, while we're here? You're going to lose my face for a second. Or, or, or can we do the ones off the playlist that I sent? Those, those uh, were, I felt like, the top picks. Well, on the death one, you sent the whole album over. <laughs> oh, shoot. If you go to the other playlist, that's the one that's got all the other stuff on there. Oh, okay. That would have had a singular death song. Do, do, do. Like I, th I think like I thought of the exact okay. song to really pinpoint the ascendancy influence. Scavenger of Human Sorrow is on here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You going with that? All right. Yep. And then, so we got... Reroute to Remain, the title track from In Flames. Hysteria by Muse, still stick with that. Mm -hmm. Burning Angel by Arch Enemy, that's a great song. Mm -hmm. uh, Follow the Hollow by Soilwork. Empty as Still by Dark Tranquility. Um, what else have we got on here? I mean, there's loads of stuff. It's, uh, there Can we, we put that, that playlist up there as well? Oh, with, with the link? So people can jump yeah. in or even just Is copy this a paste public the whole playlist? List? yeah yeah oh yeah sure then we'll do that then we'll uh we'll we'll put the whole thing up um with the post where we do the podcast and we'll put it on the youtube video as well so yeah because there's just Everyone. so many other really fun little influences that while we talk about all this heavy stuff and like i was listening to puritanical misanthropic euphoria so much of Dima Borgir and all those things there are also things on there like Dash Man, i just spotted something that's that's literally i would have talked about this if i'd seen it the first time around the leaving song part two by afi what a song what a band mm -hmm. Yep. Um, what's nuts album. is like that high note that I hit and pull harder. That's when I started getting into AFI and I was like, oh, you can sing high too. And that makes sense. So it's like blending in things like AFI, early fallout boy, early my chemical romance, beloved early from first to last, all that stuff on top of the super tech death metal plus the metal core melodic death metal is what made a sentence. I think that's why so many people gravitated towards that record, but it has a little bit of everything. There really are elements of black metal, death metal, emo, punk, hardcore, metalcore, all that stuff in this one thing. And that's the same thing we go back to on all of our best records. I think the new record too, the new record has moments of punk next to classical, next to death metal, mm -hmm. next to things that just shouldn't go. And that's, that's the trippy of sound maybe. And just having everything and not being afraid to have everything. And it's the times, those three records, where we've said we're going to stay away from these aspects of Trivium is where we were muting a big part of what Trivium is. And it's just allowing everything to be there. And me saying, no breakdowns, no screaming on Ascendancy, that's, that's muting part of Trivium. And on Silence, not being able to scream and not having a lineup capable of playing the fast technical stuff, that muted part of the Trivium sound. And Vengeance sticking in that, that same key, same tempo, same lyricism, it, it stayed away from what Trivium is. So I told, I told Stephen Hildes on the last talk that we had, I was like, if you see some interviews, I'm talking about right, Stephen Hill. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Stephen, if you see me start talking publicly about how I'm going to drop some key ingredients to Trivium, I need you to text me right now. I need you to have a pact with me. Text me. Be like, Matt, you're not doing this again. Because I've done that. And he brought up a really interesting point. And um, because we, we actually did the podcast, we did, we did the first part. I had to go because of press, but it went so well. I was like, dude, we need to book another whole batch. So I texted yeah, so like, please. That, yeah. I was like, book another batch. But then we realized I didn't record part one. So we had to re-record part one over again. So we did three parts, basically. But in the end, he said, he's like, you know what was really interesting, Matt? He's like, talking to you now feels so different than the first time I talked to you. So the first time mm -hmm. he talked to me was on Silence in the Snow. He's like, I was talking to you then, but it was an anniversary of Pull Harder. And he's like, when I brought up a sending to you, to you it was like, he was, he was like, it's like you forgot about that song and that record and the great things the band did. And after that talk, I started going, holy shit, we made Ascendancy. This stuff all happened. And yeah. it, it snapped my mind back into a different place. He also referenced something I never thought of, or, you know, having talked for like three or so hours about our catalog. 
our glory days in the UK, it was about nine or 10 months. We only had about that much time. Like yeah. the band took off. We did those tours. Then like a lot of rough stuff happened. Our band wasn't speaking. All the stuff that happened behind the scenes, and including you know, our favorite bands bullying us and treating us like crap. And then all that stuff made me rebel against the good things. I'm glad it happened as it put us where we are now, but we only had about nine or so months to even kind of enjoy what happened. And it happened mm -hmm. so fast we didn't get to enjoy it. So it's like, I forgot about those moments. And it's been a really interesting time in my career now to look back like, wow, look at those great stuff that's happened. And I, and I feel like that sin has brought everyone across our career who liked all these different records all the back into okay. one. And now we're back on this place where we can give people music that makes sense of everything we've ever done. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that sums up the the, the new album uh, very succinctly. And I think, you know, with everything that's going on in the world right now, there's never really been a better time for everyone to have a new Trivium album to all get excited about and feel good about. And I'm very confident that when people hear this record, they'll be feeling good about it. Um, what Thank the Dead so Man Say is out April 24th. Matt, it's always a pleasure. Thanks so much. And, and good Likewise, man. luck with the rest of the cycle, however that may pan out in these strange yeah, times. Definitely, we find man. In. definitely. Thank you so much for everything. I'll talk to you soon, man. Stay in touch. Nice one. Thanks a lot.